ones, but we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you all for for joining now. If you just got here, and thank you for being here for the whole day. If you've been here for the whole day, um, this is I think one of the most important conversations we'll have today because it's really about uh, the work that folks are doing to to institutionalize hip hop, but also to to transform institutions. Um, in some ways, this, this panel grows out of my own experience participating in the Show and Prove conference organized by, by Dr. Johnson, um, which, was, which is a, a conference that happens in a, in a university environment where people are presenting papers. And one of the papers that got presented at the last year I went to was by a, a scholar in Toronto who was talking about, um, his research was around freestyle and, and, and the ways in which the city of Toronto was embracing um, MCs and freestyling, but not necessarily changing themselves. So, so kind of like this space, right? We're in this, in in these fixed chairs that 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 feed into a particular way of people learning and seeing and 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 um, consuming information. Versus, we oft we all know that usually the way that information is is. Is developed looks more like what Jaquanda was doing in her small group. It's a circle. It's a cipher. It is it is the ability to move in space. And so one of the things that he was talking about was the dynamic of the way the audience, the way the audience could engage with the artist, changed because the audience had to be separated. Versus before, this is because they they were invited into the I'm gonna the the, the Toronto equivalent of the Kennedy Center, the the National Center for the Performing Arts, and so. What happens to hip hop when it goes into an, in, into an institution? Is it transformed by the institution or does it transform the institution? And I thought about that because I felt like one of the things that I took away from that was that any place that Words, Beats, and Life would partner with in the future, if, if the place we were partnering with wasn't committed to transforming itself, we shouldn't partner with them. We could work with them, but they're not a partner. And so thinking about how we would not be corrupted or changed or, or, or made to be more like the people that are larger or better funded, but actually make them more like the folks that they're trying to serve and to reach. And I, I wanted to just say that because that's, that comes out of that direct experience being organized by a scholar to gather a community of people to learn about what people are doing, what's going well, what some of the challenges are. And that's what I hope for this panel. So um, uh, unfortunately, Dr. Toby Jenkins couldn't join us. Um, she's in South Carolina, weather messed up her flight. Um, so I'm really happy to have Jeff Chang here, who helped me put together the very first um, remix in the art, the first and only remix in the art of social change in the Bay Area uh, back in 2013. Dr. Jared Ball, who's the former uh, editor in chief of the Words, Beats, and Life Global Journal of Hip Hop, um, and has gone on to do super amazing things that, that were talked about in his introduction. I wanted to talk to the three of you, really, because I feel like this idea of, of you transforming an institution rather than being transformed by it. Um, I feel like each of you is a great example of that, but maybe, maybe you all would have um, a different a different perspective about the role of the academician, of the scholar, whether that is traditional or radical, in trans in, in, into making universities liberatory spaces for education through hip hop or whatever means you choose. So, what what do you think about your role as being a, an agent for transformation of the institutions that each of you is a part of? <laughs> Softball. I, I mean, li listen. So first of all, first of all, Mozzie, thank you very much for having me and and for putting this together. It's been been very impressive, uh, and I appreciate being on on this panel. Is it on? Uh, is your mic on? Oh, well, I don't know. Is it? Is it I'm yes, sorry. Is this on? I'm yep. sorry. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and it's, a, it's an honor to be back, you know, to be back in this museum, uh, uh, the, the library museum uh, that I haven't been in in years, so it's been weird just being here. Um, but the question, I mean, honestly, for me, the question is, is pretty heavy because I'm coming off of about a, a 10 year fight with my institution that I've lost, that I'm, I'm just taking a big L. So uh, we were just talking with, with, with uh, Professor Nichols, Jason Nichols earlier, he was asking me, how you doing? And he said, how did you survive at Morgan, at an HBCU like Morgan State, which is where I teach in Baltimore, by the way. I don't, you know, sorry. Um, and I said, I got marginalized. I got full professor, I got tenure, and they got, and then I got put in a corner. Wow. So, uh, uh, 
I am in currently in some liminal position that has no official title and no official hierarchy and the checks and the health insurance keeps coming. So I just keep showing up. I feel like, what's his name in office space? What's his name? <laughs> the, the dude they stuck in the basement with the stapler. I'm like, that's, that's me. Uh, so, you know, like, you know, uh, the, the students uh, still appreciate my classes. The evaluations are great. Um, I'm able to have some sort of positive impact with my colleagues and comrades outside of the institution, but the institution itself has won. Uh, it, has, it has not, it has incorporated uh, what I and others have tried to do and continue to try to do and, and sort of stripped away anything that might successfully motivate students to become a threatening force or the institution mm -hmm. itself to change. Mm -hmm. And uh, those who have not been pushed out entirely are more or less existing the way I am. So. Uh, much like hip hop and anything else produced by an oppressed community, we have to find ways of, of making meaning out, you know, outside of institutional spaces. And that's what I continue to try to do. Before we move to the other, because can we talk about that work that you're doing outside of the institutional space? Well, I mean, so nowadays it's mostly through uh, being, you know, a low level YouTuber and being supportive of, of grassroots journalism and, and organizational work. I mean, I'm a member of the All African People's Revolutionary Party. I support Black Alliance for Peace and Pan African Community Action and Community Movement Builders and FTP Movement. And, you know, I mean, uh, and that, that kind of work is what I try to do. And I try to produce content that motivates young activists, young scholars, and tries to inform people in, in ways that I've looked to be informed. And I try to use it in, in, in to engage with people uh, in ways I can't officially through the institution. Um, and so that's basically what it is. So. Can I ask a question? Let's, let's let each of the masks not come to you right after. Go ahead, uh, Dr. Johnson, you want to go next or, or, or Jeff? I mean, my relationship to most institutions, I'm, I'm always somewhat conflicted um, because, precisely because of the, the ways that they're not gonna change. There's no love there and I don't expect it to be. Um, I have colleagues who are much more explicit in their relationship, their feelings about their relationship to the institution and refer to virtually any university as the plantation mm -hmm. <laughs> and then the kind of collectives that were able to form and nurture that take care of us and that make it possible for us to stay. They refer to that as a kind of quilombo. And so thinking about how to teach students how to be in relationship to an institution that also allows them to hold on to uh, you know, what my advisor referred to as the undercommons, like ha holding on to and creating those means of, of, of pushing back and finding your own path without the expectation that the institution is ever fully going to support that. They might have moments because it makes them look good, but that's not their project. And things change real quick when money changes, when politics change. So... Yeah, I have to then be very purposeful about how much I'm willing to put in for those kinds of things. To whatever degree I can siphon money or opportunities and, and make that available for people. If I, you know, I got a lot of funding to support Show and Poo, which was great. So then figuring out how to make that spread as much as possible and making sure it was still free and open to the public and things like that became really important. But also, I'm not going to break myself. Like, if it's all on me and they're super happy to leave it all on you um, and then I get sick and I'm on my own, like that's a problem. So figuring out how to do that, how to do that to support people and so it's more intimate interventions rather than like large scale institutional and when they are large scale, not expecting the, the continual growth and expansion approach to things, but actually um, pausing against all of those ways that you're compelled to repeat certain structures of power. You're compelled to repeat a kind of capitalist approach. You're compelled to repeat um, an approach that is uh, perpetuates hierarchy that establishes itself as elite. Like you're compelled to do these things, and so resisting that is, you know, it's a daily struggle. It's a daily thing to check in with myself. What am I trying to do? Where's my responsibility lie? when is some ego shit in the, getting in the way of myself moving forward. So it's, it's all of those things. Um, 
and these two have done way more institutionally than I am. I'm, I'm, I'm like seconds a breath into tenure. So it's also just paying attention to what people do, what they're able to create, where there's pushback in trying to maneuver in a way that tries to learn from how other people have had to do the work. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you're asking a real person, <laughs> a real personal question, just to, to to lead us out here. I mean, for me, I um, I, I, I'm not affiliated with any institution right now. I'm coming off of 12 years of having been engaged in, um, you know, institutions first, a, a large university, um, and then second, uh, a racial justice think tank. You know, and um, and I've just stepped out like just weeks ago to go back to writing full time because I feel like that's what uh, I need to do. And it's, it's a risk from a professional point of view. Um, you know, I could fall flat on my face and the lights could be out by Christmas and my wife's up there and she's shaking her head. That's not gonna happen, <laughs> but it could, you know, it's a possibility. But that's the reality is, is you know, uh, you spoke of the undercommons, right? We sort of create this network of folks from coast to coast, um, and uh, and we we do that because we are our jobs in a way our jobs I'm putting scare quotes around that uh, is to be able to to do the larger thing of being able to carry on um, the, the knowledge right to be able to to take what we've learned um, and what we are still learning and to be able to transmit that to folks, and then to be able to put ourselves uh, in places where we can take risks that we know we can take. Um, and Dr. Ball and Dr. Johnson have taken so many risks with their careers. Um, to be able to take these risks because other people can't take those risks. Um, and, and, and then to be able to create this sort of underground, if you will, of folks who can um, support each other uh, you know, make it rain when we can, um, you know, just uh, lift each other up um, because we have to, you know, um, get together when we agree. You know, sometimes we don't necessarily agree, but we're all there because we all need to be able to be there for each other. Um, and so I think you're getting to a real type of personal question that has to do with this larger thing of what it is that we're all here to do, and there's so many teachers in the room. Um, there's master teachers right here, there's master teachers. All of you are master teachers, or gonna be master teachers uh, in different types of ways, and I think that that's, you know, we are that, that, that network for each other. Um, and so it's really important to be able to have somebody like you and Words Beats in Life have been able to do this, be, be able to create this foundation and platform uh, to be able to bring folks together um, literally for the last 20 years, um, and to be able to then help us now have this platform to think about what the future looks like. So, so I asked that question in part because um, a lot of the conversation among people in the audience in previous panels is really about the value of institutionalization, the value of creating museums, the value of creating new um, minors and majors at, at institutions. So thinking about the lives that you all are living as individual academicians, doing the work that you're doing, you're, you're on the other side of the thing that, that people are chasing on some levels, right? Um, so this, that's why I wanted to start there. But the, but the secondary question really is, is rooted in what you all said around the room you've had to create for yourselves outside of the institution to do the kind of educating, organizing um, work that you do. And so in, 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 in preparing for this, I reached out to Jeff about wanting to talk about the lessons learned from the hip hop political convention, um, talking to Jared about the work that he's doing right now as uh, creating media that's reaching thousands of people all over the country. Um, I, I wanted to talk about kind of the, the role of the academician in, in political organizing, not just political education, but political organizing. Could, could one of you speak, particularly the hip hop academician, um, could, could one of you speak to that maybe, not, maybe it's not in your actual institution, maybe it's in the books that you're writing or the films you're participating in, but what's the role of the hip hop academician in political education, not just cultural ed education? 
Go ahead, Jared. Uh, so, so much like I've, I've always felt about the, the approach to hip hop, I don't think it needs to be any different than anything else. So in other words, I think, uh, you know, the, appro the, the role of the academician should always be uh, akin to some form or fashion of Walter Rodney's guerrilla intellectual. It should always be some sort of um, uh, attempt to use the privilege of the of the the life of the the relative privilege of the life of the academic uh, to to take resources as Dr. Joy James always talk about talks about from the institutions out to the people. However, those resources look whether they're intellectual, material, whatever. Uh, so that's the same way I feel about hip hop, and I've always felt that the that the the, the point of the hip hop intellectual, the academic, or or whatever, is to to have uh, an exploration of hip hop expose the inner workings or the, the the realities of of the broader world, not just to be a focus on hip hop for the sake of being hip hop, but to say here are these people producing this cultural expression we can understand better their condition and how to free and enhance their freedom and sovereignty through an exploration of what happens to the, the product or the cultural expression they produce. And that's what I think, uh, yeah, that's what I think we should, our, our role should be in trying. Yeah, I fully agree with that. I fully agree with that. Are there microphones on? I don't know if it's I on. thought I turned, yeah. So, okay. It's on, it's just loud. <laughs> I mean, I fully agree with that. And I think, I think the thing to pay attention to is while I recognize that there's a lot of value in establishing relationships to different institutions and being able to put things into the world that would not have existed prior to, it's also paying attention to how that happens. Like being brought into the folds of the institution is not gonna help hip hop at all. Mm -hmm. Like you need the institution to make changes in and of itself. So I've, a thing that I think for hip hop scholars who are coming to this out of a certain kind of love of hip hop already is how much hip hop taught them to do the thing um, in a certain kind of way. So as an ethnographer, um, and I was, you know, my f first ethnographic, full on ethnographic project was with hip hop culture and dancers in particular, learning a lot about how to approach research responsibly and in a way that centered people and not just kind of whatever rules I was taught to, to apply to the thing. So rather than that approach, learning a lot of that from the community, realizing that there are, um, that there's a, like an, there's a, there's a, a research driven aspect to practitioner work. That is a thing that I needed to pay attention to and learn from and for the anthology, I have two articles on women ethnographers of hip hop dance, and most of those women ethnographers are practitioner scholars. They started off as practitioners, and so they come into the scholarship with um, a kind of um, a, a foundation that comes from having been practitioners. So it matters how that happens. That an institution is going to say put it, put hip hop on something doesn't mean much if ultimately they're going to continue to do everything that they already continue to do, they just use that name. Um, it's, the, it's the making that institution shift or change part that tends to be more my concern. So not that I, I don't laud those moments when something can get established, but I'm really sensitive to how it looks, how it functions, how is credit given, when are people, you know, how are students supported, who's gonna have access after the person who's gonna fight for this no longer works there, and the institution can continue to operate the way it always operates. Like, ensuring that it doesn't just repeat the same old, same old. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, it, it feels like the goal actually is not to let the institution, um, you know, uh, yeah, break us, but really also to, to, uh, to mold us to institutionality. So that, inst that the institution becomes a medium for us to be able to do the kind of work that we need to do for the communities and for the communities to do the work more directly, I should say, first, that for the communities to be able to do the work that they need to do for the communities, right? So, um, so to kind of go back to this, this idea that Dr. Ball is raising of, of us being kind of like gorillas in there um, and then to go to Dr. Johnson's idea of like, what do we do to transform 
the spaces uh, that we're in when we're in that. It goes to pretty much any institution, right? It, it goes to, to thinking about like, how do we create a space where there's enough autonomy that we can be able to, that we're able to build um, uh, the folks that we need to build up, build them up. And then for them to be able to take that on and expand upon that um, down the line. So I, I just think about the time that I spent seven years at this <laughs> big university um, as a time in which we were trying to be able to create that aut autonomous type of space. And it's worked to a, a certain extent. There's always going to be limits. There's always, always going to be limits on that. Um, we're not disrupting the tenure system at all, right? I came in, I didn't come in as, as somebody who was tenure track. I came in some, through the sideways door uh, doing what they thought was going to be like a, a cute little like, you know, arts sort of student services program. Um, but having said that, now it's become a place where there is a lot of like independent scholarship work that's been able to expand, that it's become a student autonomous space and that we've been able to build really deep ties with the community with that and that, that continues to go on. But there's gonna be you know, circumscriptions around the kinds of things that, that even you know, Ida Institute for Diversity in the Arts at Stanford is gonna be able to do. So. so uh I was, I was ear hustling on a conversation that Hadari, who was on our first panel, was having with, with Jeff earlier. And, and Hadari raised a really great question that I would love to know your opinions on, um, which was this idea of institutions credentializing people with degrees in hip hop and the people, per, and the people presenting the credentials aren't hip hop, like the, so in the sense that they don't necessarily know what it is they're looking at or what it should be, they're really looking at it from a humanities point of view. Does it do X, Y, and Z? Or from a, um, from a sociological. They're not necessarily, the, the people that are reviewing, that are making decisions about books and tenure, et cetera, aren't necessarily people who can certify that person's hip hop credentials, but they literally have a hip hop credential. I wonder what each of you think about kind of how that changes over time as more people get Get, get a credential, or as maybe institutions engage with community in a way that's different than it currently does. I, I, what do you think about the, the, the reality that right now in DC, in, in Washington DC right now, there are 11 hip hop courses that are taught at multiple universities that didn't exist the last time we did Remixing the Art of Social Change. There were probably two of them then. So there's a lot more people who are taking courses in hip hop who, who might, you know, Get a, get a certificate or eventually a degree, depending on where they are, but the person that's teaching them isn't necessarily a hip-hop artist, maybe not even necessarily a hip-hop scholar, might just be a musicologist, might just be someone who's studying other fields that are connected. I, I, so as people that are in this space that, that know it, that write it, that make it, what do you think about kind of the state of um, hip-hop in the academy for, for undergrads in particular? So just so I'm clear, so, just real quick, I'm not, I may not understand. That was a long question. <laughs> well, because you're, you're asking if, so for instance, like, when it comes to tenure or conferring even a, a particular degree, the issue shouldn't be is everybody in the process of conferring that status an expert in this, in every element of of either that field or that program. It's a matter of assessing, did the person, student, participant, achieve all of the steps required? So in other words, if, if there's a, if there's a, that's why I'm, like if there's a field of hip hop, mm -hmm. like history or psychology, if it satisfies all the requirements of any other field and people satisfy the requirements matriculating through that field, it doesn't necessarily require that everybody involved in even each of those courses taught is an expert in the overall field being the focus, if that makes sense. And then it certainly does. when it comes to tenure, it's not a measurement necessarily, I don't think it's supposed to be a measurement necessarily of someone's expertise measured by other experts is a measure of did you satisfy the requirements of that institution over a period of time therefore earning this that or the other so in other words I don't think you need to have a, a, a hip-hop 
artist or even scholarly expert at every step of the, of the process be involved in conferring. So I don't see it as a necessarily a specific problem if those, if the, if the, anyway. So no, no, I want, because I, I actually wanted you to answer this. So let, let's stick where you are because you, of, of all the people that I know, <laughs> You are the, you're, you're one of the most rigorous scholars I know and will be like, this is some BS. It's, this, is, this is not well, like, so like, who gets to decide who? But that's the point. But so, so even when I'm critical of someone else's scholarship and I would want others to be critical of mine, it's based on maybe when I've done it, the few times I've done it, it's based on a certain level of what I think is expertise in that field. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I'm not, but that's different from judging someone as to, but even scholars I'm critical of or disagree with still have done enough to earn tenure or to have earned a certificate or to have earned even the label of expert in, in whatever field. So the disagreement is just a disagreement. It doesn't mean that, they, that, that I should, regardless of my personal views, it shouldn't be on me or anyone else to, to, to in other words, even when I, even in certain oh, steps sure. that I've taken, sure. I've even had direct confrontations and said, this isn't a measurement of your agreement with me. This is supposed to be a measurement of have I satisfied X, Y, and Z step, hmm. at which point you're supposed to sign off and move on because clearly I've done that. That's and that's true. the point I'm getting at. So I don't, this, this issue of agreement and then, and then expert conferring expert, that's, I'm, I'm a little less, Somewhere in there, my point is, is there is a good point. And I'll just leave it to the geniuses in here to that find was good. it. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jerry. I, I learned something there. We hear you, Dr. Ball. Woo! Woo wee! Yeah. No, but, but I think you're... Is this working? Yeah. I, I think the larger question you're asking about is what happens to hip hop or what happens to this knowledge, right? What happens to this, this knowledge that's being transmitted from this black freedom culture, right? Once it enters into these white institutions, that's the larger question that mm -hmm. you're trying to get at, right? Yeah. yeah. And I think that that's, that's part of what is, is, is something in process that we have to be able to confront and deal with as we're dealing with these institutions. Because the larger thing is to be able to transmit this knowledge, right, which holds these seeds to liberation for all of us, um, and to be able to continue to push that through. But then there's these different processes that they're going to put us through that are all formed in these uh, Eurocentric notions of merit and meritocracy and blah, 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 and all institutionality and how knowledge gets transmitted. Um, and so that's the part where we're always having to, on an individual basis and then to collectively be gorillas in that, re in that regard. Um, and then to be protective, right? So on the one hand, like for instance, I don't know if Martha's here. Martha was talking about us building up archives. And I think that the, you know, the, the debate that Martha and all of us were having about 20 years ago was, should hip hop even be in the universities? Does, is the, are the universities where, and the museums, let's, let's add the museums in there. Are universities and museums institutions where hip hop goes to die? There you are, I see you. Yeah, right? Is it where hip hop goes to die, right? Is this where everything actually comes to a screeching halt because we know about the whiteness of these institutions and what we're gonna have to deal with and then suddenly you've got, uh, no disrespect, but you have jazz studies. Right, where a lot of the folks who are in the field are not folks who are necessarily, um, who are folks who have been brought in or folks who have passed the professional aspects of it, mm -hmm. but might not necessarily be getting at th the deeper aspects of the knowledge that's being transmitted that needs to be transmitted. Um, that's the traditional critique of, of jazz studies, which is why there's a critical jazz studies, right? Um, and so the, the, that's the thing. That's the thing that we all kind of have to, guard against as we're, because hip hop should, should, as somebody said earlier, belong everywhere. But it belongs everywhere because they're the seeds of liberation for everyone in it, hmm. right? And part of fighting these institutions and the whiteness of these institutions is, um, is that those multiple layers of how we have to be able to kind of address um, our positionality as individuals and how to strategically, how we think about what it means for the next seven generations to be able to have this stuff available to them. Uh, I have like a lot of, I have multiple thoughts going in my head and I 
didn't have coffee today. So I'm going to try to... <laughs> it's not the same, but okay. So, I mean, the aspect of, of any kind of degree or certificate conferring thing is, it is, it's a series of steps you take, right? And so, there's always going to come a point where somebody has done those steps, earned that certificate, and you talk to them and you feel like they don't rep the thing that you love and care about, and that's going to be a point of concern. And I think that because anything like that is just, it's going to be those steps. And so part of what I always kind of come back to is not simply that the thing exists, but in how it exists. The reason I write about Africanist aesthetics is because I don't think that you can talk about with any kind of depth or critical lens, you can talk about hip hop without pushing against the ways that um, Western forms of thought don't do the work of allowing us to attend to the things that are actually happening in all of these expansive and beautiful, holistic and interesting ways. Um, which is to say, if you're already in an institution, it's already gonna be within a structure that has decided that music is separate from dance, is separate from poetry, is separate from science, is separate from math, and that is already doing a certain kind of work. And then your degree, in order to pass those steps and to be considered by experts in humanities or social sciences to be legit, you have to do the things that they f have determined over centuries to constitute what, you know, le legitimate whatever. And that is also going to do a certain kind of work. So I'm always conflicted when it comes to those things because I don't want the, the hooray aspect of things to overshadow the underlying epistemic violence and erasure that's gonna happen. That Intikana is talking about not ever hearing about Puerto Rico until college and having to really seek that out, same. <laughs> and that's a problem. And it, 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 I think it's, it's, it's a problem precisely because when hip hop becomes a kind of academic commodity, it makes it, it, it's, it can circulate in, in, in very easy, available, discursive ways. So the discourse around multiculturalism makes it really simple. Everybody's involved, everybody's down, it's peace and love. And then it allows them to not say anything and kind of use it in, in the way they want to. So, and then there's a proverbial they, which is to say there's sometimes things are real cool and real interesting and engaged and criti you know, critical and other times it's gonna be real problematic and both those people can also have the same certificate coming out of the same program. So to me it's much more about the how and not simply that the thing exists. The conversations about like hip hop's relationship to the academy 20 years ago were mm -hmm. urgent and necessary but it was because it was already being brought into the academy. That's right. And all the university saw was like, this will get butts in seats because that's how they get paid. So, they were like, yes, take that platform, more and more students, cool, cool, cool. And, and then if you start to do or say things that they, if they pay attention long enough to be like, oh, that's, you're actually encouraging students to be the problem here, <laughs> then that money goes away. So right. yeah. it's, it's just, it's always just really layered and really complicated. And my concern often comes back to the kind of underlying intellectual formations that even determine what becomes possible to study. They're very hierarchical institutions, so if you don't have an advisor who signs off on your thing, you can't move forward with your project. Trisha Rose talks about, in Black Noise, her dissertation committee, out of concern for her future employment, being like, we don't think you should write a dissertation on hip hop, we don't even know if it's gonna be here by the time you're on the job market. And that was their legit concern, <laughs> out of a help to a student, but had Black Noise kind of not come out, like that's an incredible shift to what hip hop studies looks like now. So the how and, and the, the nature of the work are what concern me or what's interesting to me. And um, because hip hop can be anywhere across the university, it also highlights the, the structures in the university that become intractable to the kind of work that you really want to do that builds with community that is interdisciplinary, that is connecting people. And then you're in an institution that's like, now you begin the bureaucracy of applying to that, and did you submit that form, and you didn't do that on time, and that has to come from this budget, not this budget, and this budget doesn't allow for that, but it can allow for, and it's just, mm -hmm. 
the barrage of stuff that usually it's the one or two people who are doing it that you get buried under. I'm saying a lot of things, but the how matters. To, to, just to follow up, does, does the who also matter in terms of how many people are at your university? Because the idea that the show improve in particular was on your back, that, that you needed to make that happen, with support, of course, but, but does, does having more, and I'm asking this question in part because some people are now creating departments and, and, and majors, so, that, so ideally there's more people there to shoulder burden. Does, 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 does being alone or, or with very little support versus a, a, an institution making a commitment to a larger investment in the kind of work you're doing make a difference, either from experience or from what you've witnessed? And after that, I'm gonna throw it open to the audience to answer. It's, it's, you know, I don't know other people's experiences. For me, it's, there's gains and losses with both. On my own, I, and I say on my, show and prove, hip hop studies conference, um, is we've had four iterations. Uh, it started off as just an idea to gather people who I knew were still, they weren't published yet, but they were doing incredible work, incredible work, and they needed to be in conversation with each other. Because what happens is you're doing this work and you're really in conversation with people at your institution, but you might be the only one talking about hip hop. So you have people who can check you on certain historical things or methodological things, but they don't have a clue what you're talking about. Um, I met scholars for whom they were the only one in their country doing work on hip hop. They needed an audience of people who can tell them, nah, that's not cool, or oh, this isn't, or have you heard of, they needed, I, ne I wanted to create a space where not only could we meet each other and hear each other's work, but also you can be responsible to a collective of people who had a stake in what hip hop studies became, what that looked like, how it entered the institution and not simply that it did. Um, and it immediately got bigger than I ever planned. I planned a seminar. And then I got applications from people from all over the, the world and people came through and then they were like, so at the next one you should do blah, blah, blah. And I was like, there's no next, this was it. And so then there was a next and then there was a two more after that and the budget got bigger, but the workload got bigger. Then labor on me got bigger. Labor that is not, is, it's ultimately extra. It's considered service. I have to make an argument that it's also doing research because I'm at a research institution and they only really give me professional credit for research. So me doing all this labor, they're like, that's nice. Also, we need your book for tenure, otherwise you ain't gonna get this job. Mm -hmm. So the bigger, bigger, more, more money thing doesn't work for me anymore. That's too much. And there are people who want to volunteer, who want to be down, but they also have lives and there's, you know, this is something they're doing on the side. So then the person in charge is in charge precisely because you need somebody whose job it is to be attendant to all the things and that just got to be too much. So now I'm exploring the possibility of smaller scale collaborations just to resist that impulse like that it should be bigger and that it should cost more. And that means I'm a fundraiser and I don't do that well. That's not my heart. And you know, the budget, the third, the, the fifth time around it was like non-existent. So I was, I, I needed to figure out how to do things in a way that were sustainable and invested in networking and branching out and moving beyond a version of doing a thing. And, um. and, and Jared, to that point, like, you know, when I met you at the University of Maryland um, doing free mix, um, my introduction to the, the term emancipatory journalism, um, doing that as a solo project, passion project on the side, to now um, working in a collective, producing media, that is, that is generating some revenue for the people that are involved. Th this question of old Jerry with Freemix, literally <laughs> delivering it hand to hand to places to now being a part of a, a group of people to share some of that labor outside of an institution. Well, well old Jared is old for real now. <laughs> so, so part of it is old, this old Jared can't do what the young one was doing, even if the context was the same. So like, um, once upon a time, uh, going to the, the local whatever market to get the discount bulk blank CDs and getting a burner and getting a, <laughs> turning my basement office into burners and, and doing all that was, I mean, that was possible, walking around, going to conferences, going to meetings, going to organizational events, going to cafes and handing them out and doing all that, that was possible. Nowadays, it's not. 
uh, even if the context for CDs still existed, which it doesn't, um, I couldn't do all of that. And, and one of the problems that I think we have in general is that it's too easy to do a bulk of what I do now, which is to go into my own home office, turn on a camera and talk into a mic and talk into, you know, go on YouTube. It's easy to podcast, it's easy to, it's, it's easy. Um, but it's not the same beautiful project uh, on a number of different levels. Um, but it's also me trying to adjust to something you told me. I mean, you were one of the first people, Mozzie, to sit down and say, the, the CD you're handing out is just a blank, because I didn't even have labels on it. I didn't even have covers on it. And you were like, if you hand this to people, they're not gonna think you even care about it. And I've always, I've never forgotten that conversation, by the way, I always struggle with that, because I was like, but the content is so dope. <laughs> and you were like, but there's no fly label on it. <laughs> the people not gonna, I was like, but the content. And I think I'm actually wrong. I think I was wrong. I think a lot of, so part of what I've been trying to do lately is try to focus more on the branding and the, 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 the and I'm not comfortable with it. I don't like it. I'm like the content, and, you know, so, but I don't know. So, I mean, it, that's, that's the shortest answer is that, that um, uh, the, the, the beautiful project of the mixtape as emancipatory journalism, which I'll, will always be my favorite project is just can't exist now. And that's part of the problem that I was arguing with the project then that exists now. The colonial process and structures have reformed. They've rebranded themselves. They've wiped out that beautifully unsanctioned space of the mixtape and turned it into something that you can almost only exclusively do under the, under the, 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 the surveillance and guise and permission of the most elite corporations, which is something we were supposed to be fighting about 30, 40 years ago. Anyway, so, so, sorry. Last question for me before I throw it to the audience, because Jeff, uh, a lot of the work you've been doing lately has been, or my introduction to you was, was Can't Stop, Won't Stop. So the, the work I've, that I've seen post that um, seminal book has been about lifting up the voices of other scholars. So this idea of taking an individual approach to being a storyteller to, to leveraging your position to lift up the stories of other people. I wonder, can you, can you just share with us the, the difference in your own experience in doing those two things? Uh, it's part of the same continuum of work, I think. Um, because, yeah, we all, we all face individual types of um, situations that we have to get through. And, and, uh, and at the same time, the impact that Dr. Ball has had, Dr. Johnson has had, like, has impacted all of these folks. So all the folks that you've gathered for your conferences, they all know each other now, and they're doing work together, and they're, they're out there doing the thing. And Dr. Ball, you've influenced thousands upon thousands upon thousands of folks to be able to be in the work, um, and that stuff continues. And I just think about, like, in the work that we've been doing, it's, it's been largely, we've moved towards talking a lot about hip hop, not just as an arts movement, not just as a cultural movement, but as a pedagogical movement. And so that's the, the basis of what Freedom Moves is about. And it's, it's an anthology for a reason. It's because there's all of this amazing work that's happening all around the world, Palestine, Syria, South Africa, um, Native America, um, um, uh, all around the world. And that is having that impact and having that, that kind of reach um, but folks need to be more connected to each other. So this is why I think, you know, like what Dr. Ball does with his media work, what Dr. Johnson has been doing with convening folks, what we've been trying to do in our own little kind of a way is really about saying all of these folks are out there. Let's just figure out how we can create this much more network, much more um, uh, connected under comments. Um, the hip hop education hashtag, uh, as you, as Elliot knows and everybody else knows, is like one of the most active ones, mm -hmm. you know, on Twitter. And uh, you know, tens upon thousands of, of of followers and folks. AERA has a whole hip hop um, mm -hmm. group, a whole I don't I don't know what the official the caucus, I guess, you know. And this is happening, of course, in all these other types of spaces as well. Um, these are all spaces that are yearning to be outside of the disciplines that they're in, right? Because all of the work that we do is naturally interdisciplinary, but, um, but it's, it's really about that at this particular point is to think about what Martha's doing in terms of linking up folks who are archiving, um, you know, 
uh, what Hadari's been doing with linking up folks who are working on, on youth development and poetry, all of those types of things, Jaquanda um, and her work around healing, you know, all of this type of stuff. We just, it's, it's about trying to get us together and trying to, trying to make us much more aware and conscious of, about, uh, of, of the fact that we're, we're doing this all together, sharing with each other, like you're doing here. Can we get a microphone down here for Elliot, then Martha, then Dr. Clark? Actually, Martha, then... Um... Dirida, yes. Thanks. Yeah, so first of all, I just want to say, Dr. Johnson, I think the, the conferences, multiple ones that you've done, have been very powerful. And for me, for the one that I attended, um, I was really grateful to be able to be there to connect people with, like, um, you know, Tasha, Dr. Tasha Iglesias, to, to meet Piper, right, who I sat on a panel with um, earlier this morning, and, and other folks, right? It, it, was, it was really powerful, and those are important spaces, even if temporary, right, um, to, to have. And, and Jeff, to, to you too, for like, you know, Fifth Element was really important too. That's where I met Emil, you know, and, and that, that's how I ended up going to Cape Town and working with him and having this ongoing dialogue and, you know, that kind of thing. Um, Dr. Ball, I, I wanted to say too, and this is you know just based on my personal experience, but those classroom, the, the class evaluations, the student evaluations that you're getting, and the the fact that you can hold space uh, and continue to do so even despite being you know restricted, relegated, whatever, I still think personally uh, is based on my experience um, as a student, undergraduate, and then graduate having professors like yourself who are very inspirational, who get you to think critically and create that space for conversations and ideas and inspiration to happen is really important. Even, again, even if it's based on, you know, you as the, the rogue, you know, or gorilla, as, as Jeff was saying, like being there, creating that space, um, having that is important for young people to have that professor who's willing to, to create that space, say those things, give them, impart ideas. I mean, I had a in my freshman year of college at UC Santa Barbara, I have a fellow gaucho here. When I, I, had a, I had a class called Introduction to Racism. And that was the first time that I had a, like a formal class to talk about that and to talk about white privilege and white supremacy and get in, you know, introduced and have kind of a, start to think about intersectionalism and, and have that introduced in formal language and, that, and, and have a discourse in a space that was quite different from any of my other classes. So I think despite the you know, the restrictions, the limitations of, of the, the systems, the universities, I think those, I think that's really valuable in addition to the work that you're doing outside. And, I, and I'm speaking also as someone, who, you know, I collaborate with folks who work at institutions, Dr. Rafael Travis at Texas State San Marcos, Dr. Alexander Crook at University of Melbourne, and we're putting out publications, peer-reviewed peer stuff on therapeutic beat making, hip hop therapy, et cetera. Um, but I act mainly outside of the, of the academy, and every so often I'll be able to come in and do a little presentation, but you know, there's someone outside, but I still think that there's value in that and creating, so I wanna praise you for what you're doing and, and say don't, don't underestimate the impact of the value, especially, I say this as a developmental psychologist, on you know, older, mid-adolescents, older adolescents who are going through an identity you know, development and, and having those professors and mentors is so important, so that's, uh, yeah, no, I appreciate Thank you, Elliot. It, it, just to be clear, like I, I was just speaking to the idea of, of this, as I understood it, this idea that we were able to transform the institution. No, and and I, so I'm just saying that. I guess my question at the end of that would be, do you think that it's possible to see that, even if there are still restrictions in place? Oh, yeah, no. Kind of trans oh, yeah, so, so, so again, I'm very excited to be in the classroom. And, and my classes are dope. And my students, like one of the reasons I, that, that, that I've able, able to survive despite the marginalization is because uh, student evaluation is always so strong and supportive. So my thing is once we get in the classroom, 16, 17 weeks or whatever, I'm going to change you and turn, turn you into a revolutionary. That's my goal. <laughs> and we start from that. And then we have, and then, and it's great. And so, but I just, I'm just trying to be clear about what I understand about what I'm doing with the institution. Yeah, it's right. not, I'm not under any illusions. So anyway, but thank you. Martha? Yes, um, oh my God, there's so much to comment on and, and just I'm grateful for you all to, for your 
your stories because I think everyone is playing a role right now in hip hop and especially in academia. Like you need people like me and Jeff that come in and out. We, we're not necessarily PhDs, but we're, you know, we can go in and out of these spaces. And I think you're right. What happened, what was happening 20 years ago is, has trend, is changed. And so after the pandemic, a lot of schools were, are losing student enrollment, right? And so they are looking to us hip hop community to kind of bring people back in. Um, but it's happening in interesting ways. Like I see HBCUs really taking on a role now in hip hop studies. They're creating their own hip hop studies. I'm working with um, a few of them including Virginia Union and Virginia State that just launched theirs. And I said, you know, we, we can't compete with the Ivy League schools, but if we come together as hip hop studies, HBCU hip hop studies, <laughs> then we got the upper hand and we can share our archives, which you need nowadays because I just came from Toronto at a Native American indigenous hip hop studies event conference where I heard Ernie Panicoli, one of our dear ones, and I'm calling out names, I don't care, who said, we're not celebrating hip hop's 50th anniversary, we're celebrating Zulu Nation's uh -oh. anniversary. Yeah. Uh -oh. And I wanted to kind of dispute that, but we were in a room full of young Native American, or natives, indigenous people from Canada. And I just couldn't, it, I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to, you know, burst this bubble in front of all the people. But, you know, I got receipts, I got flyers, and I could tell you when Zulu Nation started. And so it wasn't 1973, but I digress. But the point is that we are transforming hip hop in academia, and now we're in charge. You got Kawachi Clemens, he's provost. Vice Provost, you got, you know, Columbia didn't want a full uh, tenure with Christopher Emden, but you know what, USC said, not only will we give you full professorship, you will get your own center, you will get this, that, the other, why? Because Pedro Nogueras there. Mm -hmm. Gloria Lanson Billing, who is also a, a, a champion for us hip hop, you know, they, she's in, in Wisconsin. So I think we're building networks and we're starting to figure out what we need to do to get the upper hand. And let's not forget why hip hop studies began in the first place, because the young people, the students, are the ones asking for this. Emery Pettichauer wrote a whole book about it, right? And Hip Hop Congress was in all these schools. And, and so all that to say is changing. And I think this is a great conversation to continue um, to do to have and um, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, Martha. Thank you for that because I I agree that you need Thank people you. who can be in and out. You need people who are going to be in it and who are who yeah. willing to put up with being what in it means yeah. and who can c continue to help build those networks. And I would just say both and, yes and right yes and yes and because all of us began I think as students right it started right here Howard right saying, no, we're going to have hip hop, we're going to have hip hop, we're going to study hip hop seriously. Um, and then we all kind of moved through the systems that we've moved through. Um, and then we're reaching, like many of us uh, have reached like the point where it's like, okay, now here's the wall, right? Because we're caretakers of very important knowledge. We are all caretakers of very important knowledge. And we're caretakers of knowledge that's dangerous to those folks. And that's why you've got, you know, DeSantis going buck wild. And you've got all these other folks trying to shut it down, um, thinking that they can get it at the root. They can't. We know that they can't. But I'm just saying, like, let's, let's be uh, aware of, yes, we are making strides. We are definitely further than we've been. And we are also, I think, confronting um, a situation in which, you know, the the backlash is is deep and broad, and we're not there. We're not there. We're going to be fighting this for decades. Can I just yeah. add one quick thing? Because this is uh, 
First of all, it's good to see you again. It's in, and I yeah. appreciate you. you know. I, got, I got my CD still. Oh. <laughs> it's, in my, it's in my archive. I can't play it right now. My no, no, I appreciate it. <laughs> With so, the, with, well, no, there but, was no But see, this is, so, so having just left the Africana Studies and Research Center, where we just suffered the passing of the late, great founding director, Dr. James Turner, this is a sort of a similar concern I have for hip hop studies. That look at what has happened to black studies over the last 30, 40, 50 years in these institutions. It's been stripped so much of its radicalism, of its internationalism, of its socialism and pan-Africanism. So I worry that that same institutionalization where hip hop will do the same thing. Like, you know, so there are disagreements, like I have disagreements even okay. humbly <laughs> with, 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 with Brother Chang. Like I have, you know, over the, the narrative of, of hip hop history, I have a huge disagreement with that PBS series that just came out. I mean, my goodness. So, so like I'm concerned, like what version is being institutionalized and what, what beefs will happen in the institutions that have been lost in Africana studies as far as I'm humbly, aware that I, I don't want to see get lost in hip hop. Like I, I so, so it's, this, it's always a struggle. What happens when you become part of these society's institutions? This society is hostile to all of the communities involved in producing hip hop and producing all of the wisdom in all of these various fields. Um, and once we get into these spaces, I'm just worried that the, the version that they're going to encourage be told of these histories will, will make them almost meaningless and that's, mm -hmm. So I just worry, that's all. I just, no, and it's, it's, yeah. it's with great concern too, because yeah. um, I mean, you know, your struggle with the Hip Hop Museum in New York right now. I know. I mean, just that alone. With their, so if they put that version there, what happens to the version that you and many others are struggling? So that's, those, I'm sorry, those and are the No, things. no, it's, yeah. very, it's very real. And, you know, and, and th their approach to a uh, Hip Hop Museum is from an industry point of view, yeah. you could tell. Yeah. Um, but even our own people like, you know, Marcelina Morgan mm -hmm. over at Harvard, she has uh, the first hip hop archive at, at a uh, higher learning institution, which is very um, isolated and, you know, very exclusive. Like, I don't want you holding on to our archives like that. Like, that's not how you do it. And so um, I, I totally get it. And that's why we started another hip hop studies symposium so that we could remember where this all started. So we started from the beginning. We had Murray and uh, Mark Anthony Neal talk about, well, this is the book that we created because we realized that hip hop studies was growing. And that's what we got to revisit history over and over and again. The archives is how you do it. But there's a lot of concerns. Yeah. So unfortunately, I have to do what I've done all the oh, time. Oh, and I was going to talk what, about what, what infusing this, this, this in NSF research this, this and is, academia and Carnegie Mellon. And one take, second, Dear Dida. One second, because okay. there's three questions. Oh, so okay. like, so oh, okay. when people take up the time, like, <laughs> but, but this is a beautiful thing, right? Um, we need we need to go because we're we're at time, and I wanted to just acknowledge the person that hands you that mic, which is Asia. Um, yes, who's a member. <laughs> Who didn't, who didn't say this in her introduction, but she's a member of our board of directors. She's the reason why we're at this institution today. And so I wanted to have all of us just thank Asia for helping. Thank you. Happen. Thank you. She, she's actually, this is actually her very last day of work. She's using her vacation time to come in to be with us. So I just, I thought it was important to acknowledge that labor and that effort. Um, we're gonna still be around, we just won't have the microphone. So I wanna thank everybody for attending Remixing the Art of Social Change. Um, there's plenty of ability to talk to each other out in the hall, all of these folks are accessible. Um, if you still have time today, we're doing our second event just up the street at Franklin Park, um, which is Jazz and Blossoms, totally free. Uh, it started at two o'clock. It is a little chilly outside, but it looks like most folks got, cold, got coats, so please go check it out. Thanks everybody. <laughs>